Thank you for coming to Tame Your Data, optimizing GA4 with Google Looker, with Google Tag Manager and Looker Studio. Um, quick overview of what we're going to do today. Uh, so, talk about um, Google Analytics 4 in five minutes, maybe less. Um, talk about GA4 events in detail, it's pretty important. Uh, and then talk about form tracking in GA4 and different GA4 reporting options that are available. Uh, so, who am I? Uh, I'm Stephen Pashby. I'm an account manager with Design Hammer. I've got over a decade of experience in Google Analytics, and I oversee most of our uh, analytics implementations for clients. Uh, we're a full service web strategy design development firm, uh, and uh, we work a lot of Drupal, and we use a lot of Google Analytics and other Google products for uh, analytics tracking. Uh, so, quick show of hands around the room. Um, who are you? Um, any project managers in the room? Few. How about site builders? A couple of those. Uh, developers. Uh, what about communications or marketing? Cool. cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, a lot, of, a lot of people wear multiple hats. I know I certainly do. Um, how would you rate your comfort experience with uh, Google Analytics for? Uh, hold up a hand with a one to five. Five being really super comfortable. All right, we got some. Looks like a two is probably our average, maybe some threes. Uh, and then we've got some ones and fives in the room, so that's cool. Um, who's installed Google Analytics 4 on at least one website? Awesome. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how to do that. It's very straightforward. Um, and does anyone use Google Tag Manager? Cool. Uh, so you'll get some stuff related to that. Um, and who prepares or contributes website analytics reports for your organization? Yeah, it looks like a lot of folks do. Uh, does anyone use Google Looker Studio? Some, some, okay, cool, cool. So um, I think this, given this group, will hit a lot of pretty useful stuff. Um, so let's level set, I'm not a developer. <laughs> uh, so if you have technical questions, I might not be able to answer them. I'll do the best I can. Um, I'm outlining some things that work for us with different clients. Um, there are a lot of different ways to do things. Um, I'll be assuming some level of familiarity with Google Analytics, and I'm assuming you already have GA4 property and potentially installed GA4 on your site. Um, important takeaway, if you're not measuring, you cannot know if you are successful. All right, so that's, if you take nothing else away from this, that is, uh, that is probably the, the nugget of the whole presentation. So we'll talk through some significant questions. Or these, these are some questions I'd like you to think about while we're going through, uh, going through uh, the, the slides today. Um, what should you track and how should you track it? And kind of within that, who in your organization figures out what should be measured? Is that the project manager of a website? Is that a developer who's just been told, make it go, measure things? Um, is that marketing and communication? Is it leadership? Is it no one? Right? And then, once you have an idea of who determines what that is, and maybe who should determine what that is, as to who does, um, and what you should track, who needs to see the data? You know, who does it need to be reported to? Um, what's their analytics experience and comfort level? Uh, do they expect to be able to explore the data in sort of a matrix level fashion where they just kind of look at different things and can answer any question they want? Or would they rather have like a, a very straightforward bottom line report? Um, so my hope is that this session will help you move forward um, no matter how you answer these questions. So Google Analytics 4 in five minutes. So what's Google Analytics? Free analytics service offered by Google, um, implemented through adding JavaScript to website pages. Um, it was originally developed as Urchin on Demand, uh, which was acquired by Google in like 2004. Google released a service of those Google brand in 2005. There were subsequent versions in 2009, 2012, and 2020. Um, Analytics is currently used by the vast majority of website tra whose traffic analysis tools can be identified. Uh, so it's kind of the big player out there. Um, when you look at the data in Google Analytics, it's helpful to think about there really are kind of two big words. There are dimensions and metrics. Um, dimensions are labels that can be used for filtering sorting. So it could be campaign, it could be medium, as in source medium. 
It could be the event name. It could be the platform. And metrics are quantitative me measurements, numbers, right? Like purchases, event counts, conversions, views, engaged sessions. Um, dimensions and metrics are combined in reporting to hopefully deliver actual insights. So that's been basically true the entire way through with Google Analytics. Um, Universal Analytics, which was effectively Google Analytics 3, has been dying a slow death this year. Um, ostensibly, it uh, um, ended tracking in July. I think it's mostly ended tracking now. <laughs> um, you may still find people using it. The important thing is, if you have not gone from Universal Analytics to Google Analytics 4, either you're not receiving website data or you very soon will not be receiving website data. Google has probably forced upgrade you to Google Analytics 4. You should check that. It doesn't always work well. Um, Google Analytics 4, released in 2020. Um, it's an entirely new model for analytics. Um, it's incompatible with earlier models. Um, so there's no method of, of migrating historic data. So um, you, know, you kind of have to relearn things that used to work may not work anymore. So again, if you've had that sort of automated um, GA4 migration, it's a good idea to reevaluate if what you've got in place still works the way you need it to. So one of the key concepts of GA4 is engagement. Um, Google Analytics 4 operates under the assumption that specific user interactions uh, indicate that the users engage with the website. So that could be scroll, click to off-site link, file download, um, rather than the number of pages viewed or the length of the sessions, which is kind of the older model. Uh, so you'll see a lot of engaged session, average engagement time per session, engagement rate throughout uh, GA4 reporting. Um, goals and conversions are different in GA4 than they were in Universal Analytics. Universal Analytics had four types of goals. Um, one of them was funnel tracking, um, uh, as well as uh, you know things like um, uh, a page number of pages or uh, time on site or specific events as goals. In GA4, the only thing uh, conversion is a new word for a goal, and it ties one to one with some form of event. So everything is events in GA4 all the way down. Um, there's not really a great mechanism for kind of destination funnel tracking in GA4 currently. Reporting in GA4, UA had like well over 100 predefined reports. Um, GA4 has less than 20. Um, the focus is more on engaging users rather than all the different things that UA had. Unfortunately, a lot of the UA stuff actually was pretty useless towards the end, wasn't actually populated by relevant data in many cases. So it was time for a change. Um, so really, you know, is that a good or a bad thing that there's less reports? Um, it sort of depends. Um, most of the reports in GA4 work, uh, as opposed to the ones in UA that did not. Um, many of the uh, UA reports were required uh, some sort of privacy considerations that GA4 has a little bit more baked in, so that's better generally. Um, GA report, GA4 reports are maybe a little more easily customized, and the exploration system, which we'll talk a little bit about, actually gives you a lot of uh, a lot of ability to do many things. Um, but my opinion, a lot of questions you might want to answer um, aren't answered by GA4's off-the-shelf reports. So, yeah, sort of it depends. Uh, one other uh, quick thing on GA4, used to have um, properties and you'd have multiple views of a property. Uh, views don't exist anymore, it's just properties, and you can have multiple properties um, pointing, multiple data streams pointing to a single property. This lets you have a nice sort of uh, 360 view of users across like multiple websites or um, an app and a website. So that's kind of nice, um, but um, filtering for internal traffic and things like that, it's sort of a different model now. So again, you have to kind of re-examine how you were doing things under UA particularly if you had the automatic uh, upgrade. So um, let's talk a little bit more about GA4 events because that's a pretty critical concept. Um, so events fuel GA4's engagement metric. Um, 
GA4 provides kind of out of the box several enhanced measurement events. Uh, these should be enabled by default uh, when you install a new GA4 property. Um, I've, I've seen it sometimes where they don't get turned on in the auto upgrade. You really would like these all to be turned on. Um, basically, uh, these, are, these are what Google uses to drive its concept of engagement. Google also documents many recommended events. So these are, you can think of as blueprints or recipes for common events that are not pre-configured. It's a suggestion, you don't have to follow these. Um, you can also do fully custom events, which if um, enhanced measure events and recommended events don't meet your needs, you can roll your own. Um, and then you can also, using kind of the custom events functionality, effectively extend uh, enhanced measurement events or recommended events. So, uh, enhanced measurement events, talked about these are turned on theoretically by default. Uh, basically they cover page views, scrolls, outbound link clicks, site search use, video engagement, file downloads, and form interactions. Um, they cover them in a way that suits Google. It may not suit you. Uh, recommended events uh, cover a lot of other things. A lot of e-commerce stuff, so e-commerce tracking, there are recommended events, patterns for that. Um, uh, Sign-ups, social shares, uh, lead capture, um, there's a lot of gamification stuff. Uh, so there are a lot of different things. So if you haven't looked through recommended events, I encourage you to spend a bit of time on that, see what kind of suits your organization. Uh, custom events can be anything you want. Um, basically, you just need a way to say, this is a set of criteria that causes this event to happen, um, and then sends this to uh, GA4, uh, typically uh, via um, Google Tag Manager, though you could also do it with your own custom JavaScript, or you could do it with um, within GA4. I don't like within GA4, but that's possible. Uh, important stuff uh, is custom events and their parameters need to follow uh, a GA4 event nomenclature, so basically snake case, um, letters, uh, uh, numbers, underscores. Um, it's helpful to follow the same nomenclature because that will make your job easier in reporting. Uh, and there are some reserved event names which you can't use. Um, I don't think they're all documented, but it will just not work, so then you'll learn. Um, so if you wanted to extend um, enhanced measurement or recommended events, uh, you can do that. Um, to extend an enhanced measurement event or recommended event, generally what you'll do is adjust when the event is triggered or what parameters it contains. Um, and usually you'll basically implement a new event and disable the old event. Uh, if you're um, doing a recommended event, you just kind of bolt on what you need to for the recommended event, however you're implementing it. If you are um, wanting to extend an enhanced measurement event, then you'll need to disable it and implement your new event. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, do, using a GTM for that in a little bit. Uh, it's important to disable the enhanced measurement event to make sure you're not uh, double counting. Um, mm -hmm. We're not gonna talk about it in the slides, but one way we've done that is, for example, the scroll enhanced measurement event, it only gets to, it only fires on 90%. Maybe you want more granularity for that. So uh, you can actually set up a scroll event through GTM uh, and you, know, you name it the same way as the, as the enhanced measurement event. It will come over, it'll get tracked in the same way but you can adjust the trigger so it triggers more regularly, but you do want to make sure you're not also leaving that enhanced measure event that the GA4 code is adding, because then you have double counts on your scrolls. Not good. So, uh, what should you track in GA4? More questions for you. I don't have the answers for that. Um, think about what websites contribute to your organizational goals. Does your organization have defined KPIs related to your website? And who needs to be consulted or included to answer the above? Because, you know, I know developers, a lot of developers are like, I don't know, right? And so it's important to have communication between leadership or marketing and the development team so that what's being tracked is what needs to be tracked 
and it actually, and what's being tracked is actually what is supposed to be being tracked. Because a lot of times, and we'll talk about this in the next session, you could have something that's tracked that you're like, ah, that sounds like what I need, and it's really not. And so you're getting kind of inflated numbers. So once you've defined your website to interaction with KPIs, you can begin to implement appropriate events and tracking. Once you have that, you also want to think about what's a conversion. So, a conver so G4 combine defines conversions as user actions that are valuable to your business. That's you know very vague. Um, I like to think of uh, conversions as uh, so by using conversions by labeling events as conversions, you will you're able to better leverage GA4 reporting, right, and actually get more actionable information because it can understand this is a session where a conversion happened versus this is a session where some number of events happened. So that can be really handy. Um, you can label any event a conversion, but if you label too many different types of events of conversions or you don't have the right granularity on your conversions, you're like, hey, you know, I want people to scroll on the website. Scroll events are a conversion. Guess what? Basically every session is going to have a conversion at that point. So pretty useless because not every session is a success. Right, so you want to think about, you want to think kind of mindfully about what conversions are. You know, frequently that might be an event registration, or sign up for a newsletter, or sign up for an account, or something like that. Maybe submit a contact form. Maybe an e-commerce purchase if you happen to be doing e-commerce stuff. Um, but basically, if you think of the old funnel model, a conversion should be really uh, reserved for that end of the funnel. So we'll talk about form tracking in GA4 because I think it's really um, illustrative of kind of some of these concepts. So form tracking is important. Many common conversion events have some sort of form submission. And so you probably like to track that. Um, contact form submissions, for example, a newsletter or account sign up, event registration. Um, and so it's really important to make sure you've got form tracking that works for your website uh, so you can have actual insights and avoid hours of painful manual analysis. Having been an analyst doing hours of painful manual analysis, I don't recommend it. Um, so there are a few different common ways to track form submissions in GA4. Um, you could use your basic enhanced measurement form interaction events. You could use thank you pages. Um, and uh, leverage the page view enhanced measurement event. Or you can use a generate lead recommended event. So form, form interaction events, these are part of the enhanced measurement. Um, <coughs> if they're enabled, they just work when they work. There are two pieces to form interaction. There's form start, someone starts interacting with the form, and form submits, that form was submitted. Um, events fired. Uh, basically have very little control over how these are fired. They're fired on GA4's criteria. If, the, if, they, if it sees a web form and it sees a user, user interact with it and it sees a user submit it. Um, it has the form ID, the form name if they're present, form destination, and then if there's a form submission, the text on the submit button. So that's, that's, that works, right? That's great. Um, so does anyone have a Drupal website at a Drupal convention? Yeah. <laughs> have you looked at what your form IDs are in Drupal? <laughs> right? It's useless. Like this, this is useless. It's just straight up useless. Particularly if you have more than one form on your website. Um, you know, we've got a, a site that has a small contact form, a long form contact form, and a, um, a contact staff member form. So that's like three except they're placed on pages by content editors or by the, the client directory system. So there are thousands of contact forms. <laughs> and so this form interaction event is useless um, in that context. Also, if you want to use any of these parameters in reporting, you'll need to create custom dimensions for them. Because again, the enhanced measurement events, they're not there really for you. They're there for Google's um, engagement metrics. So pros, built in, cool. 
Uh, it provides insight into form starts as well as form submissions. So that's kind of nice. You can kind of say, okay, who's working and stuff. That's cool. Um, some form implementations will not be tracked by the form submit events. Um, not developer, can't tell you which ones those are. I've run into, I haven't run into it in Drupal, I've run into it in WordPress, I've run, run into it in other systems. So it's just something to look out for. It doesn't always work. Um, form submit works, for, if form submit works for your site, it works for all forms that it sees. So you have a user login form, that's a form submission. You have a search form, that's a form submission. Depending on how you have uh, maybe some other, like a resource library form, that might be a form submission. So very quickly, you can see that this is really much more about user engagement and less about an actual form submission that you care about from a business process. Um, and then, you know, just depending on how your website is, if you have a bunch of forms, you may not have enough granularity with this to have anything actionable. So if you have enhanced measurement enabled, it should be configured by default. Uh, you can double check by logging into your property as an admin user, looking at the data source, and um, just making sure it's turned on. So I got a couple screenshots here, right? You look at your data stream, say, hey, enhanced measurement's turned on. Click the gear. Uh, make sure that form interaction is turned on. Thank you page report track, or uh, thank you page tracking. So this is kind of the old school way of doing things under universal analytics. It's like, well, we have a form submission, we have a thank you page. We're thinking in terms of funnels. Um, you know, this, uh, you know, if your form doesn't support thank you pages though, may not be able to use this approach, right? But it's, you know, there's thank you page after web form submission. That's gonna theoretically fire a uh, page view event on a page, you know what the page path is, it's good. So this is almost built in, so that's cool. Um, uh, if you have unique thank you pages for all of your forms, you can use this with very little work to figure out which forms are succeeding. But if you have a single thank you page for all of your forms, you will not be able to easily report on which forms are succeeding. And uh, this can be inaccurate because Users can navigate to thank you pages. You know, that, that's, you can't stop them, right? You want them to go there. Uh, so this may not be as accurate as you want. Now, if you have a lot of traffic, that's probably fine. But if, this is, if it's a smaller traffic site, or your forms have smaller traffic, you know, two or three extra page views during a week can skew your numbers in a significant way. So not ideal. So. You know, as I said, this is basically built in. Um, in fact, you would be hard pressed to disable this if you're using thank you forms or thank you pages uh, because you cannot turn off the page views enhanced measurement event. Uh, if you turn off all the other uh, enhanced measurement events, you get a little warning box that says, hey, I'm not turning off page views. So <laughs> you can't turn it off, so that's the thing. Um, so the bulk of your configuration will be either on your website to make sure you have thank you pages or um, to uh, implement it via reporting. Um, so just did a quick thing. You can look at all pages um, under your pages and screens GA4 report. Uh, and then you'll basically be able to filter based off of something that will show your thank you pages. So it would be helpful if they're named in a way that you can use a filter to reveal. Uh, and you can see them all in one report. So here is the pages in, in screen class over time report, just out of the box. And then you can apply a filter that is for this contact form success page. And there you go. Um, with this particular site, um, uh, you don't want, uh, you could do this with, uh, if you use query strings, for example, um, as part of identifying uh, the form that was submitted if you use a single, um, success page, you could uh, use uh, page path and query string, and that would work. Um, but then again, if your query strings are not particularly useful for reporting, you've just moved your problem to a different column in your chart. You haven't really done much. Um, but in this case, this uh, site has a single contact form, so this is a fine solution for this. So probably the quote unquote right way 
is the generate lead recommended event because um, it's for website interactions that generate leads, right? Um, so it's not explicitly defined to a specific uh, website interaction. So it can be flexible based off what you need. Um, so pros supports many different form implementations. Uh, since you have to implement it somewhere, it's easy to extend it with custom parameters. Uh, cons, it's a more involved implementation. Uh, and it may require additional configuration as forms are added. So uh, basically, you could uh, configure this solely in GA4. I'll use Google Tag Manager because I want to use a lookup table to do it a little nicer. Um, so what we'll do is we'll create a generate lead event in G, uh, using the GA4 event tag in GTM. Uh, but we'll need to do a few things first. So we talked about form IDs in Drupal, how they're wonderful and very informative. Um, or not really. Uh, basically, what we'll do is we'll add a form ID parameter to the generate lead event because it doesn't actually come with one as it's defined. Uh, but we need a way to populate it with something that's useful. So um, we're going to enable um, the form ID data layer variable in GTM, um, which uh, you know, will by default, when the form submission trigger fires, will load with the form ID from the DOM. Not useful for reporting. But we're going to put a uh, GTM lookup table to map specific form IDs or a pattern uh, to useful names for reporting. Uh, so you can kind of find your specific form IDs, which are not the same thing as the web form ID in the admin, just FYI, uh, to figure out how web forms are added to your content. And if you have to work with a pattern, um, there's a regex table, which works pretty well. That's what we we'll use. Um, so once we've got that lookup table populated, we'll use that to, in our generate lead event. So in GTM, go to variables, built-in variables, make sure that you've got form ID turned on, because otherwise you can't use it. Uh, and then you'll make a custom variable, um, a regex table in this case. You could just do, if you don't need to use regex, you could just use a, um, a lookup table. It just doesn't support regex. Um, you put your input variable, it's form ID, so whenever this table is called, it will consult the form ID variable as the input variable, and it will output whatever you tell it. And then you put in your pattern, and then you put in your output. So now that we've got that in place, we can actually set up the generate lead event. Um, so you know, if you've got any GTM experience, it's pretty straightforward. You use, uh, you know, you're going to go ahead and uh, make sure that you've got an event tag that, I guess it's now the Google tag, because Google changes things every week, it seems like. Um, but basically, uh, you want to make sure you name your event generate lead. Uh, you add a parameter for form ID and select your lookup table to populate it. Then you need a trigger um, that executes submissions. But you probably also want to, when you make that trigger, make sure it uh, either doesn't fire on pages that are your login page or your search page or specifically excludes like your, your search form ID or something like that. So there's a little bit of tweaking there. But you save that and then publish. So looks like that. Right, so we've got our, our event name, our form ID, parameter, and we, we're hitting the, the lookup regex table. Uh, our trigger is form submission when the form ID doesn't contain search. And we, had a, we also have a publication search on this site, so we've got two different versions there. Um, the way we add our GTM code, it's not on the user login page, so that bypasses that. Um, so, what we demoed show, uses GTM's built-in form submission trigger type. Um, but you can use other criteria. So you could do the same pattern with page paths. We've done that. Um, you could do it with history changes. It's a little fiddly, but we've done it. Uh, so history changes are useful when your path changes, but it doesn't trigger a page view load. So there's nothing to actually hook onto there. Um, but uh, GTM supports uh, a variety of triggers around history changes, so that can be helpful. Um, or, and this is really common in the WordPress world, uh, a lot of the common WordPress plugins um, don't, like they're not picked up by uh, the GTM event, uh, but most of them provide um, instructions on how to trigger in GTM. It's one of the nice things about using GTM is lots of people use it, and so vendors know that lots of people use it, so there are 
many solutions out there. So if you're using like Contact Form 7 or um, uh, any uh, Ninja Forms or any of the other WordPress form solutions, you'll probably need to use a custom trigger in the listener code um, to do that. So once you've got your generate lead event, you've got a little more stuff to do. Um, you want to make sure uh, to mark your generate lead events as conversions if they are for you. Uh, and then you also need to register the custom dimension for the form ID so you can use it in reporting. Um, it'll take about 24 hours after registration for the, the custom dimension to show up in reporting. So you know, you have to be patient for a second. Uh, so in your GA4 admin interface, there's custom definitions. I didn't retake the screenshot. It may have changed. They totally changed the UI uh, in the last month for the admin. So that was surprising. Um, but basically, create custom dimension. Dimension name, that is what it's going to appear as in GA4 data. That can be whatever it needs to be for you. Scope, this is an event scope. You should have a nice um, appropriate definition that allows you to actually read what's there. Uh, event parameter, that has to be exactly as is passed from your event. If that's not exact, um, it doesn't work. Also, I don't think you can delete these. Um, so, <laughs> you know, double check. Copy and paste, don't type. Um, so, which one should you use? Right? Um, if you have a single form on your site and no search or login forms, form submit should work. And you don't have a lot of technical debt for doing stuff that you don't need to do. Um, do you have a few forms with distinct thank you pages, or can you make those? Uh, thank you pages should work, uh, but you have to keep an eye out for false positives. Um, you have a large number of forms, maybe some programmatically generated or placed by content editors. Recommend using the generate lead and GTM because I think it makes my life easier. So, uh, reporting options. So now we've got some form of uh, appropriate form submission tracking. Tracking. So how are we going to report on it? So we'll talk briefly about three different options that are in kind of this whole realm. Um, default GA4 reporting and what customization you can do there. Um, GA4 Explorations and Looker Studio. So we'll do kind of an implementation for form tracking for each of these. So um, default uh, reporting with nothing else going on. We've got the form submit event. It happens theoretically on our website. Uh, we can drill down or segment uh, in default GA4 reports to provide some insight into how many form submissions have happened. So it looks like this. Uh, so it's like, OK, uh, you, you go to your um, events uh, report under engagement. Uh, you're like, you click on form submit, and you get this report. So it gives you how many forms have been submitted in this date range by day. So that's something. Again, if you only have one form, this might be enough. might work. If you've got a bunch of forms, this is not very useful. GA4 exploration. So it's a more advanced and interactive format than um, the uh, default GA4 reports. Um, it's really you think of it more as a data analysis tool, and less than less as a reporting interface. Um, it does a lot of stuff. Um, according to Google, it does ad hoc queries, switching between exploration techniques, allows you to do sorting, refactoring, drill, drill down. You can use audience and segments. Um, you could like literally do like multiple days of training on GA4 explorations. We're not going to do that today. We have nine minutes left. Um, instead, uh, we're going to talk about just how to quickly set this up again for our use case, right? Um, so you need to create a new exploration. Um, I generally start with a freeform exploration because it's most flexible. Uh, not all dimensions and metrics will be available in all exploration types. I don't like to be hemmed in, so I start that with the free form. Uh, once you create a new exploration, you can add or adjust your imported dimensions and metrics. Um, imported, important word, imported dimensions and metrics are metrics that are available to be used in your exploration. This is different than having them actually in the report. If you don't have your dimension, imported dimensions and metrics, um, you won't be able to use those dimensions and metrics in the report. So it's got to be imported first, then you can add them to the report. So um, I just took a little screenshot. On the left of the exploration, 
You can add dimensions and metrics. Pretty nice interface. You can search and check. You can add as many dimensions as you want. Once you've got all of yours checked, you hit import, and then they'll be added. Same thing with metrics, exact same view. Um, so there are a lot of options. Um, for our purposes, we're going to use session source medium, page path, plus query string, and event name is our imported dimensions, and session event counts as our metrics. Um, this is so that we could answer the question of where do people come from who submit contact forms or submit forms, and what page do they do that form submission on? Right? That's more useful. Um, this, is, this doesn't expose um, uh, the, the specific contact form. We could do that with u using event name. We just aren't um, in this case. Um, so we'll need, once we've got our, those uh, dimensions and metrics imported, we'll need to either drag and drop or double click <coughs> on the session source slash medium and, and page path and query string dimensions and session source and event count metrics to add them to a report and that will give us this report. Uh, and then we'll need to, uh, that, as, as stated, that basically says sessions and pages, how many sessions were on this page that came from the source, and how many events were in that session. So that's not very useful. Um, we also want to add a filter for event name by whatever our form submission event criteria is, and then that will drill it down nicely. So we've got our in rows, we've got our dimensions, values, we've got our metrics. We can add a filter for event name, exactly matches form submission, and that gives you something like this. Um, not the prettiest thing in the world. Um, doesn't even come with pagination. That's neat. Um, uh, but you can do some fun stuff with it. Uh, you can, uh, if you wanted to clean it up a bit, um, you could. Um, maybe remove uh, medium and just have session source or session medium to reduce the data. You can do some stuff to uh, sort of combine rows or columns. Uh, so there are a lot of options there. But now I'll show you a better way. Uh, Looker Studio is a mature data visualization platform um, that can do a lot of custom reporting for analytics data, including GA4, as well as other systems. So it's a little bit agnostic. Uh, supports a lot of customization visualization. One of the things I really like is you can actually expose user filters and then give a report to someone that they can then interact with, but they don't, they're not like in the whole mess of wires that is explorations. Um, and also, bonus, um, does anyone, did anyone use email reporting and user universal analytics of customer reports? Some people, yeah. It doesn't exist in GA4. Um, you can use it, you can configure it through Looker Studio though. Um, so you'll need to, when you create a new G, uh, Looker Studio dashboard, you'll need to set at least a data source that you have access to, um, and then the appropriate uh, GA account and property. Um, once you've got this confirmed, uh, then they'll drop a default chart on there and you can customize away. Um, so when you create a new report, it'll say, give me some data, click on Google Analytics, then you can search through, uh, you need to be logged in by a Google user that has access to some analytics data, uh, select your account property, add. So similar to explorations, you need to select your uh, dimensions and metrics uh, from your data source, but you don't need to do the whole import and add. It's just, you just add it, it's fine. Um, so we'll do the same sort of thing. We'll add session source of medium, page path, and session event counts as metrics. Um, quick note, well, two quick notes. Not all GA4 dimensions and metrics will be available through Looker Studio. It's not really documented. Um, if you want to know whether something's available, uh, what you can actually, in Looker Studio, look at, um, you can explore your data source, and that will tell you everything that's there. It's a lot, but it's not everything. Sometimes you're going to run into stuff. Also, if you add new custom dimensions or metrics to GA4, you need to refresh your data source in Looker Studio. It doesn't happen automatically. So, looks like uh, basically we add our dimensions, we add our metrics. You can pick and choose or autocomplete. Uh, and then at the bottom of your configuration column, you hit 
you add in a uh, filter. Similar sort of filter, event name equals our event name, and you save. Uh, and um, I didn't take a screenshot, I'll show you a screenshot in a second. Um, so it gives us basically an equivalent chart that looks better, uh, and you can share. But the nice thing is we can then add viewer filters for session source medium, page path, and date range that we can then, when we share it with someone with viewer permissions, they can't break the chart, but they can explore within those bounds. We can also schedule the emails. Um, quick note on the scheduled emails. Looker Studio only supports a single set of scheduled reports per dashboard. So if you want to do more, you either have to make a bunch of different dashboards, which you can, just takes time, or you have to do the paid version of Looker Studio, <coughs> which is not as simple as signing up, though I understand it's not particularly expensive. I've been trying to sign up for that for two months. I theoretically have a call with a Google account rep on Friday to actually do this. So uh, what this delivers is a pretty nice looking report. It's got pagination. There we go. Uh, and then you've got um, drop downs where you can select all or just certain session source mediums, page path, or uh, a date range. And from your view, you can hit share, schedule delivery, and then say who it goes to, customize your subject report, send now, and, or you can schedule it. Uh, if you, what you get is basically an export of that report in the email, and then a link to the, um, to the view version of the report. So if you want people to actually be interactive, they have to have access to the view version of the report. So, again, which one should you use? Well, if you have a single form on your site, no search or login forms, default reporting probably works. And now you know how to do that. Uh, if your stakeholders want to do like a deep dive into all the data, explorations are probably the best tool. If you or your stakeholders need professional looking reports, like leadership needs to use it in a leadership meeting or something like that, or you know, marketing director needs to report up on things, uh, Looker Studio is really nice. You need people who need regular reports, Looker Studio will allow you to email those to them on a schedule. So, in conclusion, identify and track what's important to your website. Um, recommend leveraging common GA4 patterns, recommended events and uh, conversions to align your KPIs and how GA4 measures. Um, configure appropriate reporting. Think about your audience. There are many options. And have fun. So, questions. Any questions? I talked a lot. Um, yes? You mentioned uh, scheduled delivery exports. Do you know what form that comes in? Is that just like a computer sheet? Uh, so the scheduled delivery is effectively um, a, uh, so the question was, what format does uh, scheduled delivery come in? Uh, scheduled delivery is an email uh, that has uh, a PDF in there of the report and a link to the report. Okay. Yes? Sorry if this is uh, remedial, but what links the, the GTM account to the GA4? Sure. Uh, so the question is, what links the GTM account to GA4? So uh, GTM is a, um, a tag manager. So you need to add tags in there. So we didn't include it in these slides. I did a session, actually, um, I think I did one for Drupal for Gov webinar. So you probably could look it up. But uh, basically, um, you need to, uh, there's a container code that is provided by Google Tag Manager. That needs to get added to the website, and then you- In addition you, to your- Well, uh, no, I'll, 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 so what you'll do is, uh, in GTM, you will implement your Google Tag there. It's very easy, it's like Google Tag, you drop in your data stream ID, hit save, hit publish, uh, fire it on all pages, and then you don't need the GA4 code in your website, it's implemented by GTM, and GTM is added to the website via the container. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks for the great presentation. Please yes. correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but uh, one of the reasons they rolled out GA4 was because of GDPR and user identifying data. And what I'm wondering without having used GA4 myself is, is the quality of reporting less meaningful than GA3? Is it more complex to figure out what's going on? What's, what's the real world result? Sure. Uh, so the question is, um, one of the reasons for GA4, um, was one of the reasons for GA4 uh, GDPR or privacy compliance? Um, and does that lead to um, less relevant data 
uh, on the GA4 side. Um, so officially, Google's reason for GA4 was to support uh, multiple uh, websites feed and apps feeding to a single property. That's what they say. Um, there is definitely a lot more privacy stuff baked in. Nominally, the um, nominally the there, there are mechanisms to say, I want this data processed in like an EU data center rather than a US data center because that's a lot of the concern for GDPR um, regulatory bodies is that the CIA could go to Google's data center and say, give me this data and there's no recourse for the people whose data is there. Um, you know, that's, that's nominally there. It, uh, the jury's out kind of officially on whether GA4 actually is GDPR compliant. Uh, the folks who write about this generally offer competing analytics properties and they say no. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's a little bit unclear. Reporting wise, um, the base GA4 data, I don't think it, uh, G GA4 reporting is not very useful in a lot of ways as we've seen. I think the other, the other stuff that you would do, you can still do like so, you can't violate Google's terms of service by passing um, uh, privacy data from anonymous users. They have to consent to it. But let's uh, two options. Uh, one, you can uh, connect to Google Signals, which basically says, "I'm going to follow. Uh, I'm going to share my data with Google that, for my website. Then Google will share demographic data of other website." similar to yours to extrapolate what is likely based on machine learning demographic data about your users. So it's a lot of hand wave, but it's there and it sort of replaces the demographic stuff that UA had. Uh, the other thing is you can pass, if someone has a user account, specific user ID information if you want to track specific users because they have a business relationship with you and then the, the reporting is actually, you know, you have to do some custom stuff, but it, it's it's full feature. Um, one last thing on that. GA4 theoretically can operate cookie-less. I don't think that's been rolled out yet, but that's what they say. So I think we are um, about five minutes over time. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'll be around if you have other questions. I like to talk about this stuff. Thanks.